this is Myra Elaine on the Buying Space channel. Today I continue with Adult Bible Studies. God Abides Winter 2022, 23 to 2024. Time flies. Anyway, we are on these daily Bible readings. I never read from the uh, primary passage for the lesson. I leave that up to the Sunday school teachers at United Methodist Church. Uh, what I do is I do one of the supplemental readings that supports the ideas in the lesson. And I come to the book of Daniel. Uh, the first two readings of this week are from Daniel chapter 1. So I'm going to read Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter. Um, there are only eight verses uh, to read as far as the reading, but uh, I like to be more encompassing on what is actually going on in the entire 21 verses of the chapter. So Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Joachim, king of Judah, unto his hand, and some articles of the house of God, which he carried to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles unto the treasury house of his God. So Nebuchadnezzar took the items out of the temple. And took them to the land of Shinar. And the land of Shinar is just uh, like saying in the United States of America, we live on the continent of America. But America includes Canada, United States, Mexico, Central America, and South America. It's all America. So the land of Shinar was a larger area that had cities in it that was basically Babylon. So he took them back to the land of Shinar. Then the king instructed Ash Panaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants to some and some nobles young men in whom were there were no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace, to whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. So when lands are conquered, sometimes what happens is they come in and they take the most talented people and the leaders of that country out of that country and take them with them as captives. And one of the reasons they do it, this is so that the land that is left has no leadership. And the people that, were, that are the smartest are unable, are gone. So the people that are left are the people that are kind of unable to lead and figure out a way out of the oppression of the occupying force. Also, they were learning the language and literature of the Chaldeans, which is very ironic because Father Abraham, when he was Abram, lived and was born in the Ur of Chaldees. So here these young people would be learning the ways of the Chaldeans, which were the ancestors of Abraham. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of wine, which he drank and three years of training for them. So at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. So basically, they were going to take them and teach them their ways 
and not and have them forget the ways of their forefathers. And but they were being treated very well. They were eating the same off the same out of the same kitchen that the king was eating out of. They were eating good food, they were well taken care of, and they were being trained. Now, um, from among those sons of Judea were Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. To the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. So he gave them Daniel, the name Belteshar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Michelle, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So they even changed their names. We are going to transform you. We are going to change you. We are going to teach you our ways and you are to forget your old ways. You're not even the same people. Even though they were of the blood and descendants of David. They had thought that they could change them. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested to the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the stewards from the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Ezekiah, please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink, and let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you will see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this manner and tested them ten days and at the end of ten days their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables so Daniel discerned he picked his own battles and he didn't argue about being taught their ways he didn't argue about the name change he didn't argue about anything but what he was putting in his body our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and he wasn't going to defile his own body by eating food that had been offered to um, strange gods and who that violated Jewish eating customs. And there were rules set in place by the Levites that even by modern standards we can look at and say this is a better course of nutrition. This is pure. Um, I eat pork myself, but I know that pork is not as good for me um, as lamb or other meats that are pure, uh, that have less contamination in them. And so... Daniel and the Levites and the line of David, they knew this. They knew, they knew these rules, that this was um, a pure way to live, 
to be sanctified in God. And these were the edicts given to them um, as they were growing up. And they were good rules to live by. So he wasn't going to defile his body. That's the battle he picked. But otherwise, he was respectful to them. And he approached the eunuch in a respectful manner and had a discussion with him. He didn't yell. He didn't scream. He didn't say, oh, okay, I'm going to go on a hunger strike. He didn't do any of that. He just had a discussion with them and made a request. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king interviewed them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hezekiah, Michelle, and Azra. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astronomers who were in were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued the first year of King Cyrus. So they did not compromise when it came to defiling their bodies. They compromised on everything else. And they continued to pray to Yahweh. And they prospered. And this is a great lesson for us today. We, as Christians, are surrounded by all kinds of temptation and wickedness. We are living in a day and age that we don't really have a Christian society anymore. We say we do, but... I've been in chat rooms in the last two days where people were selling and talking about articles of divination that were not of God. And if they're not of God, they're of the devil. And good Christian people, who some of which go to church, read their Bible, uh, maybe they go to church online, not in person, and they pray for people uh, who are in need. And they are generous with their friends at times. And But at the same time, here they're selling articles of div divination that are not of God. They have compromised themselves. Uh, I was a Christian from 5 to 15, and then I became an atheist. And um, I was an atheist for over 40 years. And then after that, I became a Christian again. Well, while I was an atheist, I would read uh, my horoscope. And it was fun to me to read my horoscope. I knew that uh, astronomy and astrology did not mesh, did not make sense, and that the stars have drifted over the last 2,000 years, and the signs that are in the sky, the constellations, are not aligned with the current uh, astrological charts. Uh, I was aware of that. But those constellations are named, and the planets are named after Roman deities and, and Greek. And so those, there's not a constellation called Yahweh. Um, so those are all pagan deities. So if you read your astrological sign or your horoscope, 
first of all, it's, it's scientifically inaccurate because of planetary drift and the change of the places the constellations are in the sky. So it's even though there's science to how our mood changes and everything according to where the moon is because it changes the water on the planet and in our bodies. Um, and that was that's true of the planets, our environment affect, affects us. And the study of that from a scientific point of view um, would be fun with Yahweh because we're studying creation. But astronomy has become more like a religion because it's not scientifically accurate anymore. And also, what was used to set it up were pagan deities, pagan beliefs. So, um, I mean, beyond the 2,000 years ago, it was accurate scientifically. It's no longer so. And... So when you read your horoscope, when I went back to being Christian, I stopped reading my horoscope because I had taken astronomy in college. And I had studied astronomy and I knew that the constellations were not in the same place they were 2,000 years ago. And I knew that the constellations and the planets were named after pagan deities so it's not like I'm going to not call Saturn Saturn but I'm not going to spend my time in any kind of divination practice because when you read your horoscope it's divination because it's telling you what's going to happen that day so it's predicting it's fortune telling and so I don't think as a Christian I should be doing that practice. Now, am I going to judge other Christians that do that? Absolutely not. We all make our own choices. I think sometimes people do things because they just don't have a realization um, that Saturn was a Roman deity. So it's sometimes there's a lack of knowledge and sometimes People know that, but they don't put the two pieces together as far as, is this from God? The planet Saturn was created by God, our solar system, our universe. Our planet was created by God, our sun and our moon, but that doesn't mean that we should worship them. Should we be aware of how there's low tide and high tide uh, because of the position of the sun and moon? Um, in our solar system, absolutely. We should be aware of the tides. We should be aware of the things that happen on our planet and why. And we should be aware of science. There is nothing wrong with science. God created the heavens and the earth, and we are just studying God's creation. But there's difference in knowing low high tide and high tide and why we have um, sunset and sunrise and knowing why near the full moon um, there are more bursts those types of things we need to know as inhabitants of our planet but at the same time we are not to worship the sun or the moon or any planets in our solar system and previous civilizations did in the absence of worshiping our Lord God, Yahweh. So be careful on what you do. Um, I don't judge you if you choose to do those things, but maybe it's time to look into the origins of those practices and if they're accurate. Um, if you want to be um have a good relationship with God. Uh, part of having a relationship, any relationship, is sacrifice. And if you know that a practice you're doing that you think is just a little harmless thing, like reading your horoscope, um, is not pleasing to God, 
and you'd have to think about it from his point of view. You're honoring all the Roman and Greek previous deities and you're not honoring him. What would please God more instead of reading your horoscope is if you decided to do something with this book. This book is about Yahweh. It's not about Saturn or Mars. So let's just take this Bible. If you want to be random about how your day is going to be. Now I used to do, when I was an atheist, I did this with a dictionary. I would open up the dictionary to a page and then I would close my eyes and I would find a definition and I would let that definition be on my lips to learn a new word and to somewhat guide my day because I will continue to try to use those words in sentences. This is what I did as a teenager. Don't ask me why. So anyway, I'm going to do this. I got my eyes closed. John 7, chapter 7, verse 28. And Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from. And I have not come out of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know, but I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. As Christians, we are supposed to be Christ-like, and you are to know God more than you know things of this world. So, it's my spiritual advice to stay away from things of divination that do not have direct a direct source from God from our God and that's my advice if you choose to do otherwise you're still my Christian brother or sister um, but I would appreciate it if you would consider what I'm saying and getting the things out of your life that are spiritual but are not directing you towards God because if they're not from God where are they from you all have a wonderful and blessed day